his left foot. Never touched his right foot, his left foot. Oh, what a player. Gloves on his feet. He's a huge legend of uh, Hungarian football. He was active in, uh, you know, in the harshest communist area. Especially for the genius in culture and in sport, it was extremely difficult. We Hungarians consider him to be the greatest footballer of the 20th century. Ferenc Puskas died at the age of 79 in 2006. Hungary mourned the loss of a national hero. His funeral brought the country to a standstill. A true sign of the affection, Orci, or little brother as he was known back home, was held in the hearts of his compatriots. Emotionally, everybody was touched. Um, it's obvious that Puskas was considered here in Hungary uh, as the number one son of the nation. He, he was the most widely known person as Hungarian in the world. So in New Zealand or Mexico or, uh, or Scotland, you have said the name Puskas. Uh, you, you know, uh, the story is always the same. I was asked, where are you from? I'm from Hungary. What is Hungary? You know, that's Budapest. Oh, that's Puskas. Yes, yes, that's the home of Puskas. Puskas was actually born Ferenc Purzvelt Biro, here in the Budapest suburb of Kispest in 1927. His father, Ferenc Sr., changed the family name to Pushkas when his son was 10. Young Ferenc joined the local team, Kishpest AC, where his father was a coach. And initially played under the pseudonym Miklos Kovac in order to bypass the minimum age rule of 12. He was a one-off. Even as a child, he could do anything he wanted with the ball. And over the first 10 metres, he was ahead of everybody. And it was with Kishpest where Pushkas shot to prominence. He made his debut for them in 1943. And the following year, the club was renamed Honved after a takeover by the Ministry of Defence. That made it the club of the Hungarian army, in which Pushkas held the rank of major, hence his nickname, the Galloping Major. He helped establish Honved as the country's leading side. And in 1948, he was Europe's top scorer with 50 goals. Such talent convinced Hungary's communist government to use Pushkas as a political tool. Even the harshest communist regime needed legitimacy. It was necessary to testify that this communist dictatorship is equal or even better than the so-called imperialistic Western uh, you know, capitalism. And Pushkas was a good uh, you know, raw material <laughs> for the communist regime to say, yeah? The communist regime is uh, able to provide chances and possibilities for that kind of genius. Gustav Shebesh was appointed coach of the Hungarian national team in 1949 and encouraged the side to play what he called socialist football, with every player working hard for the others. Under him, a Pushkas-inspired Hungary became Olympic football champions in Helsinki in 1952. Jula Grosic was goalkeeper in that side, which beat Yugoslavia 2-0 in the final. I would say that with Ochi as captain, with his know-how and ability, we formed a team that was the best in the world at that time. No doubt about that. Ochi, both as captain and the most talented player, was inspirational. And he played a decisive part in the way the team used to perform to such a high level. Hungary may have been the Olympic champions, but the skeptics poured scorn on their success. Pushkas and co were determined to prove them wrong when they faced England in a friendly at Wembley the following year. The press of the West uh, countries said that it's not a real success because uh, the 
the big professional players didn't play at the Olympic Games. That's why the game against England was very, very important. The game shook the rest of the world. The visitors produced a breathtaking display to beat the English 6-3. Two goals from Nandor Hideg Kute gave Hungary a 2-1 lead. Then Pushkas produced a moment of genius that's still fondly remembered today. Sultan Sibo broke free down the right wing and passed to Pushkas. When he received the ball, Billy Wright tried to tackle him. And Ochi produced a back heel that sent Wright sliding past him. The near post was there, unguarded for Ochi to score. Very few players would have been able to execute such a move or even dare to attempt scoring a goal like that. With less than half an hour gone, Pushkas put Hungary 4 1 up. And yet more craft from his left foot almost set up a fifth. Eventually, Josef Bozik made sure with a spectacular effort from distance. It was England's first defeat at Wembley by non-British opposition. Nandor Hidaguti may have scored a hat-trick, but for most observers, Pushkas was the star. We were stunned. Because we saw a style of play, a system of playing that we'd never seen before. And none of these players meant anything to us. We didn't know about Puskas, we did afterwards. Hmm. And all these fantastic players, and they were men from Mars as far as we were concerned. And you know, coming to England, never, England's never been beaten at Wembley. This is a 2-0, 3-0, 4-0, maybe 5-1 de demolition of a small country who had just come in into European football. The captain, Frank Puskas, they called him the Galloping Major. He was in the army, so how can this guy be serving for the Hungarian army, come to Wembley and rifle us to defeat? That performance, plus the 7-1 thrashing of England in the return fixture six months later, and a 27-match unbeaten run since May 1950, meant the Hungarians, with Pushkas as captain, went to the 1954 World Cup in Switzerland as favourites. Two goals from Pushkas in a 9-0 victory over North Korea, and one in this 8-3 thrashing of West Germany, helped them top their first-round group. But the latter result was marred by German defender Werner Liebrich after Pushka spoke to Liebrich's Hungarian-speaking teammate, Josef Posipal. Pushka asked him to interpret for him and to tell Liebrich that he intended to torment him throughout the game. This was more or less the message. He said he'd roll the ball through his legs whenever he wanted and he'd make him look silly. Posipal asked Pushka not to do that. And so Liebrich took his revenge out on Pushkas. In the second half, a foul by Liebrich saw Pushkas suffer a serious ankle injury, which threatened his participation in the rest of the tournament. He was a key player and, in fact, the main reason behind those world-class results that we'd achieved. And he was forced out for the next two matches. But for Hungary, normal service was resumed even without their inspirational captain. In the quarter-finals, they met Brazil, who'd finished runners-up on home soil four years previously. A 4-2 win sent Hungary through to the semi-finals and their unbeaten record was now 30 games. A week had passed since the injury to Pushkas, but he still showed no signs of improvement as he limped around the training ground. There was no way he'd be ready for the semi-finals against Uruguay. That finished 2-all after 90 minutes and the game went into extra time. Although Hungary eventually won 4-2, they didn't have the best of preparations for the final against West Germany. Those two 15-minute periods of extra time and a little party after the game made us late for our train. We also spent time looking for a restaurant so we could eat something. And, as a result, we arrived back at our hotel between 3 and 4 o'clock on the Friday morning. Later 
Lack of rest was not the only problem plaguing the Hungarian team before the final in the Swiss capital, Bern. Feelings were running high as to whether Puskas should play. Apparently at the last meal in the hotel just before the match, a huge argument had broken out. That was because there were players who preferred Puskas didn't play. Though it wasn't that they didn't want him to play, they just believed there'd be a ten-man team because they were worried that Ochi wasn't fit enough and that all he wanted to do was to lift the trophy. Puskas did return as captain for the final, but his presence on the pitch was down solely to his reputation as he was far from fully fit. Germany had fielded an understrength side in their first round group encounter, so a repeat of the 8 3 scoreline was highly improbable. Pushkas may not have been fit, but he justified his selection by scoring the opening goal after just six minutes. And three minutes later, a misunderstanding between German defender Werner Kohlmeier and his goalkeeper Tony Turek handed Zoltan Zibor a gift for Hungary's second. Those who expected another route were made to think again, though. The Germans hit back immediately, Max Morlock reducing the deficit just two minutes later. Two from Helmut Rahn put the Germans in front with just six minutes left. But Pushkas thought he'd put Hungary back on level terms with just two minutes remaining, only for the linesman to flag him offside. The game was dubbed the miracle of Bern, as West Germany became world champions for the first time. But Hungary's first defeat in 31 games had dramatic repercussions back home. Hungarian football was supported extremely in Hungary by, by the communist leaders. But after this match, uh, I think uh, the football was, was not the favorite thing of the leaders. After the match, thousands of people went onto the streets of Budapest and all over the country to demonstrate. Firstly, because of the defeat, and then soon afterwards to protest against the government of the time. After World War II, increased Soviet influence in Hungary led to the revolution of 1956, which saw thousands flee abroad, including Pushkas and several of his Honved teammates, who were in Spain at the time for a European Cup tie. Initial reports suggested Pushkas had died, but he turned up alive and well in Austria and then crossed the border into Italy. He stayed in Milan for quite a while in order to become registered as a player. But the Federation didn't give him permission to stay. I don't know if it was for political reasons. I don't think anyone knew. So after a while, when it was obvious the problem wasn't about to go away, he left for Spain. Specifically, the Spanish capital, Madrid. He was 31 at the time, but Real Madrid were keen to offer him a contract. Looking back, it was a wise decision, but one which had his teammates, who called him Pancho, raising their eyebrows at first. He'd spent two years without playing competitively, apart from when they played amongst themselves. So Pancho became fat. Pancho, when he arrived, was overweight, so we called him fatty. But he knew how to adapt to circumstances, and he played in a position that he wasn't used to, as a striker instead of a central midfielder. At first he was chubby, then he became a phenomenon. Firstly as a footballer and secondly as a person. Extraordinary. He was a key player for our team because he was someone who could shoot from a long way out, 30 to 35 metres from goal, and score. Pushkas soon shared the extra pounds and formed an instant understanding with Di Stefano. The Hungarian took Spain by storm. He began with a hat-trick on his debut and helped Real Madrid to five successive league titles and finished as Spain's leading scorer on four occasions during his eight seasons there. 
The cinco de metro rapidísimo. He was so quick over the first five to ten meters. Besides, he was very intelligent. He looked up, had a great touch. He wore gloves on both feet. But the highlight of his career in the Spanish capital was the 1960 European Cup final against Eintracht Frankfurt in Glasgow. Real had won the trophy every year since the competition's inception in 1955. Their West German opponents had destroyed Rangers of Scotland 12-4 on aggregate in their semi-final. Madrid were determined to make it five in a row and their superiority soon became apparent. Puskas's fabled left foot helped the Spaniards take a 3-1 half-time lead. The second half belonged to one man, Ferenc Puskas. He scored a further three goals in 15 minutes to make the score 6-1. Even today, he's still the only man to have scored four times in a European Cup final. That performance just served to underline his standing as one of the world's greatest goal scorers. They were part of the 200-plus he scored for the record Spanish champions in all competitions over eight years. Di Stefano also helped himself to a hat-trick as Real went on to complete a 7-3 triumph. In the Glasgow final, he scored four, I scored three. He beat me by one, he was outstanding. You can't compare his game with Alfredo's, simply because Alfredo roamed all over the field and Pancho was the man who finished off in the last 25 metres and the opposition penalty area. When Pancho received the ball, it was almost certainly a goal. Puskas played in two more European Cup finals for Madrid against Benfica two years later and Inter Milan in 1964, losing on both occasions. He did pick up winners' medals in 1959 and 66, though he didn't play in either final. When Real lost to Benfica in that final in 62, Pushka scored all of their goals in a 5-3 defeat. But Eusebio scored twice to help the Portuguese club retain the trophy. Although Pushkas's second hat-trick in a European Cup final helped establish him as one of the all-time greats, his quest for World Cup glory that same year also ended in failure. He'd taken out Spanish citizenship in order to represent his adopted nation at that year's tournament in Chile. But Spain were knocked out in the first round. Win or lose, though, he never changed as a person. We used to have a chuckle because he'd often put his hand in his pocket and hand out money. He even handed out clothes. Sometimes he'd take off what he was wearing and give it to a Hungarian beggar whom he'd then embrace, have a glass of wine with, and they'd cry because it was very emotional for the Hungarians to meet one another, embrace and have a drink. Pushkas remains a Real Madrid legend even today, but despite his goal-scoring exploits around half a century ago, his compatriots living at home under communist rule had no idea of his achievements at that time. He was absolutely isolated, so there was even not a single news in Hungary about how the Real Madrid is successful, how they were able to win the highest uh, uh, cups of the European Championship. So, you know, he was absolutely isolated. So the, the communist regime was able technically and physically to block and isolate uh, even the biggest Hungarian serving outside uh, in Real Madrid. So we were absolutely no information about it. How times have changed. Today, Pushkas is regarded as a hero, and his legacy is very much in evidence back home. The National Stadium, formerly the Nipsch Stadion, was renamed the Pushkas Ferenc Stadion in 2001. Ironically, the man himself helped plant the foundations back in the 1950s. He was one of the workers who built the stadium in the 50s. Uh, because it was a marketing action by the communist government to, to invite uh, the famous uh, athletes and uh, football players to uh, build a stadium. Of course, it was one or two hours and no more, but uh, it was a symbolic thing.
The Pushkas name also lives on at one of the country's leading football academies, which is named after him. Its founder hopes that the Pushkas legend will inspire today's generation and those to come. We would like to build a, a, a brighter future for the Hungarian football, and uh, we need uh, great players from the from the past uh, who can uh, testify a fabulous example for the young generation. Puskas is definitely the number one. Janos Banfi runs another academy for youngsters, Buda Juniors. He's a former Hungarian international who played under Puskas when he was the interim manager of Hungary for a four-game spell in 1993. He's a huge legend of uh, Hungarian football. Since it's free to talk about him, he's, he's just become all of a sudden uh, Hungarian's biggest person. I say this because when I was a young boy, a young footballer, you know, we knew him, but we didn't know much about him because obviously he was uh, hidden in Spain somewhere. And the legend itself is uh, still, still on. So wherever I go, I mean, travel the world, if I say, oh, I'm coming from Hungary, they say, yeah, Puskas. <laughs> Banfi, like Puskas, also captained the national team and remembers when Hungary, with Puskas as manager, visited Ireland in 1993 for a friendly. And all of a sudden, the, the crowd just went crazy, you know, like all clapping or screaming. And I said, oh, yeah, they like us really a lot here. But then I realised that Ferenc Puskas walked out of the dugout, you know what I mean? He walked on the page, he greeted the people. I think he walked to the middle and then he walked to the bench. And till he sit down, the, the, the crowd just never stopped. So then it hit me like, OK, that he's really a hero. I remember uh, when Pele scored his thousandth goal. I was um, in Hungary and I, I was speaking to, with Pushkas for some reason. I think we were at a function, and uh, and I said, "Isn't that marvelous, Pele? Pele scoring his thousandth goal? You know, a thousand goals." And he says, uh, "I I scored my thousandth goal about six years ago." The days when Ferenc Pushkas and his fellow magnificent Magyars took football by storm are long gone. For too long now, Hungarian football fans have had nothing to cheer at both club and national team level. All they have are the memories provided by Pushkas and his teammates. They wanted to make Hungary more popular all over the world by using a famous actor, Tony Curtis, who originates from Hungary. If Ochi had not been ill at the time and had been used instead, we would have been a thousand times more successful than we were with poor old Tony Curtis when the film was eventually finished. After retiring in 1966, Pushkas embarked on a globe-trotting career in management, taking charge of clubs in Spain, the United States, Paraguay and Australia, amongst others, as well as that brief spell in charge of the national team in 1993. The highlight was leading the Greek side Panathinaikos to the European Cup final in 1971. But it's for his performances on the field that he'll be best remembered and his kindness off it as well. Puskas always remained a spiritually and friendly person and a good man. And when you lose, uh, a good man is always a great loss. He went home to Hungary in 1981. The country welcomed him back with open arms. And his funeral summed up just how much he meant to his people. He was king. He was the best footballer. Everybody paid attention to him, and he paid attention to everybody too. While I was looking for De Stefano to get his shirt, I came across Pushkas. He said to me, well done. I played with your father. You are worthy of him. So I'm going to give you my shirt. From then on, it became the most important shirt I own. Pancho, as a player and a person, well, I think he was an even better person than he was a player. He was out of this world, out of this world. Ferenc Puskas may be gone, but he's far from forgotten. He's a national hero who spearheaded Hungarian football's finest times, the most magnificent of Magyars.